we need to embrace diversity within tech, within our teams and our organizations. Um, not just diversity in terms of what we usually think about gender diversity, and gender and all that kind of stuff, stuff right? Like but actually all the different kinds of minds that we have in tech. Um, I, uh, it, I kind of started on this journey. My son got an autism diagnosis. I started researching that a little bit and it became more and more insightful that actually a lot of those traits <laughs> kind of resonated with me and when I talk to other people the same with them um, and I now since then actually do have a diagnosis of my own as well so it's all very official um, but I started thinking about all the different kinds of minds that I've worked with um, over the years in tech and you know particularly on the really successful teams actually and right. the really successful teams were the ones that embraced the quirkiness of the, of the different kinds of people that they had in them. So, you know, some people who would be um, very extra, just extroverted, very flamboyant, very talkative, would maybe need to draw diagrams of stuff. Right. Other people who would be very quiet and maybe wouldn't say anything or contribute and then might just whisper this one sentence that would make everyone go, whoa, yeah, that's amazing. Really right, so all of these different kinds of minds, all these different kinds of people working together seem to be an important factor in the success of the really great teams that I've been on. And yet when I think about the work that, that we all do, right, in terms of transitioning, yeah. you know, getting organizations into, to, to, to embrace a more agile way of thinking and working, actually a lot of that inadvertently, I think, we're moving from one monoculture where it's like everybody should be like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we use paper to create requirements. Uh, you, um, you know, we have this very specific thing that you're going to do each day to a very different kind of environment, but in the same way, it's kind of a monoculture, right? So people have taken the idea of the team sit together and you see organizations where it's exclusively open plan. Yeah. There's nowhere to hide, to right? Yeah. Everyone has to be loud. <laughs> Everyone has to collaborate all the time, all those kinds of things. And unfortunately, that is just a different kind of polarization. Yeah. And what I think we've come, or we're coming to understand is that actually diversity and of all kinds, including neurodiversity, is going to be your market differentiator. Okay. So rather than wanting to, you know, your, your teams of people to be very homogenous, very similar, okay. that actually, you know, working out how to work with all different kinds of minds is, is really going to, going to be the thing that makes your products different and your teams amazing. But then... If I'm on a team mm -hmm. with, with different kinds of people, like yep. let's say if I'm on a team full of extroverts, I'm going to have a very hard time. Yep. And um, getting people to be, no matter what kind of diversity, open to those differences and finding a way to cope with them and then celebrate them, that's very challenging. Mm -hmm. How do you coach people through that? So um, that's really what the Inclusive Collaboration com Campaign is all okay. about. I don't have all the answers for any particular team or organization. I don't have a formula. I think this is one of those spaces like that, okay. where there's not like, do this, there's do this, do this, do this, do this, and it will be fine. Um, but what I, what I do have is, you know, here's some experiments you can run, here's some okay. thought-provoking exercises you can, you can do with your teams to think about different ways we can embrace stuff. Okay. Um, and so uh, there's a book, which, was, which is very minimum viable product, but uh, there's a free Neem Hub book that has some experiments listed which in it. Which is an awesome book, and I use this stuff in my class. Now, <laughs> awesome, so that's fantastic. Very cool. um, and, um, you know, also the sessions that we're, we're doing, um, the, the, the workshops and whatever that we're doing at uh, conferences and things. So, and we go out to organizations and do those as well. Okay. Particularly this past year, or so since we kind of started, we've been very much focusing on silence, helping people to think about how collaboration isn't necessarily just about uh, about talking, but actually quiet collaboration can be super, super effective. Okay. Um, so that's been great. And actually, we're just going to move uh, in, in kind of autumn time. What do you call that here? Fall. Fall. <laughs> in the fall. <laughs> um, we're gonna Football start, season. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to probably start shifting focus and, and, and starting a little bit of beginning to think about sensory environments as well. Oh, so wow. like, you know, lighter or darker, noisier or quieter, okay. and, and the effect that that might have on different people's ability or uh, preferences really in terms of how they collaborate. Okay, so I want to plug the book really quick and okay. I want to ask you about the Perfect. silence experiment. So the book is called Inclusive Collaboration Experiments. You can get it on LeanPub. Um, and it is, I find it to be very helpful, but 
I want to ask about the silence experiment. Can you mm -hmm. explain how that works? So, uh, we wanted to look at ways of people collaborating in silence so that we could practice. And initially, I did some Lego activities. Okay. Um, the idea being that you know people could try collaborating in small groups doing completely silently. And then I kind of thought, Lego's fun and people want to come, but I don't know if that's really that similar to um, your working life. Okay. You know, playing with Lego, it doesn't really matter if it's not completed or you don't. Like, people get very invested in it. Don't get me yeah. wrong, but you know, it doesn't really matter too much <laughs> um, if it if it doesn't work out. So I wanted to do something meaningful um, that people would be properly invested in wanting to get right, and I, we also uh, wanted it to have a kind of charitable lean to it. So what we've been doing with the science experiments is, is um, using these hand building, prosthetic hand building kits um, that come in bits um, with a little toolkit and instruction manual and basically you make a prosthetic hand that is then sent out to an organisation that distributes them free of charge to people predominantly in the third world who are victims of landmines and stuff like that. There's okay. so many people need need prosthetic hands um, and one of the things we do is show show a, a short video of people using the hands who maybe haven't been able to write for 40 years and stuff like that so That's it's really gift. really compelling moving yeah. thing to do um, uh, so it's just a lovely activity on its own um, but the additional the additional slant of that on the silence makes it makes it I think more impactful so they have to do it silently yeah and and, and we've just started um, experimenting even more with that. So at the beginning we used to come in, everybody introduced themselves to their team, and then we did it silently. Now we've got a bit stricter, we don't even let people introduce themselves. So they, as soon as they enter okay. the room, it's silent, you've got no idea, unless you already just happen to know them, the people in your group that you're working with, so you're in a group of three. So there's no, it's very not a loaded environment, there's yeah. no hierarchy, we don't know, you know who the other people are until the very end. Okay. Um, and so that's interesting too. And then they do the whole thing in silence. So if people get stuck, they put their hand up. Um, Catherine, my co-conspirator, sets a timer. We make them sit in uncomfortable silence for a minute because sometimes they'll just solve the problem by sitting there like getting frustrated about it yeah. or, you know, daydreaming about something else. And then at the end of the minute, I'm allowed to go and silently help them to resolve their problem and then I go away again. Okay. So um, I, want, I want to ask you about the personal question, though. Yep. Um, I've, I've been in a meeting not that long ago where it started out with that. The lady was running and said, we're just going to sit. And so she had a little meditation bell. Everyone had to sit there. And these are all people who meditate, so you'd think they'd be super comfortable with it. But I was super uncomfortable. And since then, I've been wanting to do it in class mm -hmm. and not knowing. I mean, how do people react to that when you're just, we're just going to be quiet and not talk? So mostly... It's voluntary. So people come in because they okay. want to experiment with it. And I'm very careful to always say, um, if this is really uncomfortable for you, it's OK to leave. But please leave in silence so you don't disrupt okay. everyone else. So far, I haven't had anyone leave. OK. Um, um, Generally, people are astonished by, I kind of feel like I'm spoil, uh, spoilering a little bit. Generally, people are astonished. So while they're doing the build, we get them to capture onto post-it notes every time they feel compelled to speak. Yeah. What would you, what, what is it you wanted to say? So they kind of, and they're not allowed to use that and <coughs> say, look, this is what I want to say to you, but it's just kind of a personal reflection. So end up with this big stack of post-it notes of all the different times that I felt like I wanted to say something. And then we get them to kind of sort them into, out of all those things, what, what really do you still wish you'd said? Yeah. And what did you think you needed to say, but actually you didn't really, because it resolved anyway. Yeah. And the, that resolved anyway stack is usually really big. And the things I really still wish I wanted to say is much smaller. And so then we poke away a little bit in the debrief about well, what insights are there then, about okay. how many times you're just compelled to make a noise, or, um, or, or maybe tell somebody what to do, or okay. express your frustration when actually you really didn't need to anyway. And and one of my, a couple of my favorite things that people have said after doing it, one is, oh, well, you know, outstanding thing that I still really, really wanted to say was, um, I'm sorry when something went wrong. I really wanted to go, oh, I'm sorry, like I messed up, I really apologize. And when we probed that a little bit more and said, well, what happened instead? They said, well, um, I just had to go and carry on. And and the, the insight that the whole group had was like, 
That's what we want in organizations, right? Yeah. We talk about safe to fail environments, experimentation and all that, not beating yourself up. And, 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 and that's exactly what you're exhibiting in that moment of going, actually, I'm going to let go of the sorry and yeah. go, you know, and carry on. Um, the other thing, just very recently, we ran it at the summit, somebody said that um, when they were collaborating in silence, it was almost like dance. Okay. There was this wonderful flow yeah. of, I'm doing something, oh, I'll sit back, and I can't really interrupt your kind of flow, so you'll do a little bit, and in. then it'll just, it was very elegant. Cool. Mm. So, so the so summit, you should, you keep zipping by these things, you know, <laughs> plug the stuff, people are watching. Okay. The summit uh, just happened, you're watching. much more relaxed now. Yes, the summit just happened. So um, in, in, in London a couple of weeks ago, we had a very small summit where we took, um, well, we invited people who, from all around the world, who from the beginning of us talking about inclusive collaboration have been um, ambassadors for us really and very supportive we got together we did some experiments we had some uh, we did and had some other external speakers as well um, and then we started to work out how to how to kind of get the campaign rolling on a worldwide basis a little bit more um, so now we have um, ambassadors or well, settlers if you like um, around the world, so um, we have Chris Corrier, who's joining us uh, this afternoon okay. um, in the US. It, we have if you were doing something this afternoon that yes. we were allowed to talk about. If I was doing something this afternoon. At two o'clock. That you couldn't <laughs> speak in. Across that the we hall. we weren't allowed to talk about, <laughs> then Chris would definitely be helping with that. Okay. Um, and we've got Aaron Hodder in uh, New Zealand, and we've got folks in, uh, so we've got Gitter in, in Europe. So we have... Okay. Uh, you know, I like the settlers term. That's a really cool way to say. Yeah, so um, which comes from Simon Wardley, okay. actually. Okay. Um, I had this image in my head when you talk about you know the summit or the people that come to these things of it being a room full, and, and I'm I know I'm going to be wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway. A room full of introverts and freaks who all want to be with the other introverts and freaks because that's where we feel safe with other people. And like, if you tell me you're going to come to a session and you don't have to talk to anyone while you interact with them, all day long I will happily do mm. that. If I don't have to be like da da da, da and touch anybody, mm. then it's good. But do you get the opposite end of the spectrum? Do you get the boisterous people, the loud people that want to engage, that are trying to learn more about how to interact with the other side? Yeah, 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 yeah. And actually, so at the summit, it's very much a, it was very much a mixture. So even though I even though I have a, a, a an Asperger's di diagnosis. Um, I don't shut up. I'm like the opposite of the quiet person. Right. And one of the great things for me personally from the silence experiments is it's really good practice for me. Okay. As a facilitator to not talk. Is, it, like, hard? is it difficult for you? Some, it's really hard. Okay. It's really hard. Sometimes I take like dot to dots or little activities I can yeah, do to they keep... Have those fidget to, spinners yeah, <laughs> right, to help me be quiet because okay. actually it's quite uncomfortable as a facilitator and it's helped me realize how much inadvertently when I'm facilitating, I maybe jump in and help a little bit too soon. Yeah. So that's great. I think yeah. that's, I mean, I have that in class too, but I think managers in general feel compelled to help maybe often before the help is actually needed. Mm. Absolutely. So that's great. Absolutely. So uh, I want to make sure that we talk about all the different things. So you just had the collaboration, the Inclusive Collaboration Summit. Yep. Are there any other events coming up right now that we should be or anything you're planning for the future? So, so we're here. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I know, that was our next right now, thing yes. on the horizon. Yeah. Is the stuff that we're doing right here, um, and then um, the website is which just launched today, and the URL is uh, www.inclusive-collaboration.org. Is that? Can you put that along the bottom? Oh, He's already got perfect. it. Ben's got it. Perfect. So, um, so that's literally just launching now. Again, we just got it started right now so it's very minimum viable product but um, that's where we are that's where we are okay. we're just starting to really want to raise awareness and get people in get the community involved and engaged so far really it's just been the occasional workshop or the occasional piece sure. of thing and now it's much more that we we you know we we, we really want to kind of roll it out a little more as a as a thing do you find that people get confused about the diversity I, the word, I mean, because you use the word, but it's different than a lot of other people use the word. Yeah, so... And it's a hot topic no matter what you're talking about. 
Uh, absolutely, and, and a lot of time when people talk about diversity, particularly because I'm in tech and I'm a girl, they think that you know gender yeah. diversity is the thing that I will be talking about. So you know, I'm I'm usually quite clear to say neurodiversity, but often people haven't heard that word as well. Okay. So um, so there's a there's a little bit so. But there are little phrases like avoiding ineffective monoculture or, you know, um, all kinds of minds and things like that that, that are easier to understand. So okay. one of the things that we're working on is what little strap lines can we use that make this more accessible for people to understand. And help people celebrate. That, I mean, you want them to not only accept that diversity is going to make the team stronger, but champion. I mean, it's like a really good thing if you have, even if, even if it's the friction, right? Like yeah. if I have to work with somebody who's the opposite, I mean, it's going to be irritating, but that's going to also push me to be better, I would think. So there was a fantastic piece of research about that just recently as well, where they had groups where they introduced somebody from a, somebody very different into the group. Um, and they looked at the, the groups that didn't have the different person injected and then the ones that did, and they got them to do problem solving. Okay. The, the groups with the diversity didn't think that they performed better than the other groups. In fact, they thought they performed worse, right. but they'd done way better. <laughs> okay. And when they were asked about their collaboration, they said the collaboration was harder. So it's almost okay. like having the diversity in the group forced them to be a little bit more mindful of their collaboration, like which in, in wasn't the easy, right? Yeah. Which wasn't easy. And, and this stuff isn't easy or comfortable. And yet, the, the outcome was so much better. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, right. So, and, and that's the thing I think, is it you know, just a lovely thing to be more inclusive? Is it charitable and kind and all that? Absolutely. But there There's is a selfish a, component there, too, right? right? But there yeah. is a business benefit to this. Yeah. So, so if you're talking to, and I promise I'll let you go eat some food after this. If you're talking to management and yeah. trying to explain to them, I mean, they've got diversity quotas they have to meet anyway, but if you're talking about this, this is harder to see mm -hmm. because everybody's not officially labeled. Yep. Right? How do you get the, a manager to be more open to, maybe I should go hire somebody who is the opposite of everything that I have here because that's going to create friction on my team. Yep. And but why am I going to purposely yeah, do that? Right, but the friction's what you want. So that's yeah. the, exactly. So, um, the first thing that I usually say to people is, you have a certain amount of neurodiversity in your organization anyway if you're a successful technology company. Yeah. We know there are links. Those people are already in your organization, but the environment that you're providing is tripping them up, or maybe tripping them up all the time. So it, you're not getting the Isn't it automatically going to be doing that? Because you've got different kinds of people. You're right. suppressing one group no matter what you're doing. Yeah, right. So as long as you're, you're providing a single physical environment, a single set of working processes, yeah. um, you're automatically not catering for the, for the, for the uh, talents of the people you've already got. And that's before we even talk about you know, going out and looking for more diverse yeah. people. So there's diverse people already. You know, you've got diversity. They're just most of it in hiding. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> because don't, people don't want to stand don't, out. Don't chase it, but be more, become more aware of what you have in front of you and how to support it, I guess. Provide different spaces, you know, be a bit more open to uh, creative thinking and people needing to maybe go take a walk when they're problem solving or be in a quiet space or be in a dark place or being, you know, whatever it place. might be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or equally, absolutely, yeah. equally a, a loud, noisy place. Um, and just provide provide more of a kind of tapestry of environments that people can work within and move within happily. Because even though I may have a preference to be in a particular kind of environment when I'm doing a certain type of problem solving, I might be completely different when I'm doing something else as well. Yeah. And I know that poses a problem, like financially companies are like, but it's really cheap and easy to go, oh, I'm just going to have this one kind of environment. Right. But I think once we start to realize what the benefits of, of, of embracing diverse, diversity are, then we get to a different place where it's like, actually, this is the, the thing that's going to help our teams to solve the hardest problems, yeah. create the most amazing products. And I think was just saying to you before that, 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 that really it's the opposite of the scaling thing, right? yeah. which, which I hear a lot within the scaling community about normalization, about all the teams doing the same thing in the same way. And I think where I'm, where I'm kind of heading is I, I, actually it's, but if you it's want like to differentiate It's like they're the major labels the and you're the indie punk label. 
You want to go find yeah. the cool, weird band. <laughs> but I don't mean, I don't yeah, mean yeah, that yeah, in a bad yeah, way. When I said yeah, freak, yeah, I didn't mean in a bad way. But the yeah. unique thing yeah. that's yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah. like everything else. Yeah, 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 not, yeah. You know, that's what makes it, I think to me that's what makes this whole space cool because that's how it started. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think even, so the reason I'm, I'm, I'm smiling and giggling a little bit about that is um, I used to work for IBM and I used to go in every day in a suit. <laughs> I, wore, I, wore like, sure that. I wore a guy suit, <laughs> I had my hair real harsh and a tie and, you know, everything. Um, and I worked with some amazing, super talented people in IBM. It was a, actually, from a work we were doing point of view, it was a hugely fun time. I got to code small talk all day long. It was fabulous. Um, but I used to finish up the day at IBM, get in the car, get changed in the car, not while driving, <laughs> get changed in the car and go and play the bass guitar in a goth punk band. So the idea that actually even in your IBM there's probably these punk rockers, yeah. they're just hiding, but they're there and you're not supporting them. So they're, you know, they're kind of just head down, I'll keep Which going. Which doesn't mean they're not doing their job, it's just you're not getting everything you could out of them. Absolutely. So you can exploit that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, exploit that. I'm using Support. it as a joke. Um, <laughs> One, I'm going to ask one more question. You keep saying that. I know. I <laughs> promise this will be the last one. So you, were, when you were talking about the environment, right, and quiet, collaborative, different spaces, I'm thinking there's got to be the other end, right, with loud room, crowded room. And I'm thinking if you put 100 people, they would all gravitate towards their comfort space. And they would end up working together in siloed groups where you've got the quiet people and you know the collaborative people and the loud noisy people because they're all in the same mm. space together do you think that if you have that mix that you need to find a way to get them to come out of that yeah and put themselves in an the uncomfortable space all the I, time I absolutely do I absolutely do and it's the same reason that um, in the women in tech space mm -hmm. you know like I'm a bit of a feminist I guess I don't want to see an all-female team right? because that's not diversity. Unless they're astronauts. <laughs> well, yeah, if they're astronauts, then maybe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's fine. But, but that's not diversity, is it? That's right. not the power of diversity. So, so similarly, I don't want to see all... I think, I think really we get the power from the mix, and that's why kind of when I hear, even though I know that it's with the very best intentions, when I hear folks say we recruit for cultural fit... Yeah. That kind of thing, I'm like, all the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I'm like, oh, I kind of get a bit itchy. Because yeah. I, I think, you know what, there's a lot of cognitive bias in there. Yeah. You're filtering on people who are like you, and if you only employ people who are like you. Which is a natural thing like to you, do. It's absolutely, it, and it absolutely feeds into all of our subconscious biases to do that. Yeah. So it's completely natural. Um, and I'd like to think it's something that we could start to find ways to kind of to kind Bring of get beyond. Back. Yeah. Cool. Mm. This was great. So thank you very much. So I know you've got something coming up, maybe. Mm. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. A few minutes. Uh, but <coughs> Tuesday at 2 o'clock is when the talk is. It's called Why the Tech Industry Needs All Kinds of Minds and How to Support Them. You can find the book, Inclusive Collaboration Experiments, on LeanPub. You can go to inclusive-collaboration.org, right? Yep. All right, cool. Thank you very much for coming. This was great. Thank you.